Hi everyone, I'm Cindy Jatul. I teach biology and biotech at Roosevelt High School. And if you are watching this video, congratulations, you have come to the end of the evolution unit and you're even willing to look at other examples of how evolution works. So let me shrink down here and we will proceed. And we were going to look at actually two examples, one involving the evolution of dogs and the other of antibiotic resistance within bacteria. Okay, so here we go. Here are the goals of this lesson. So after this PowerPoint, you should be able to apply the principles of evolution by natural selection to new scenarios. So in a nutshell, evolution involves variation in heritable traits. There are selective forces that impact who survives in order to reproduce and pass on those successful genes. And then as a result, we see changes in populations over time. So we want to be able to look at a couple of other examples so that we can practice giving correct explanations for how the evolution occurred. And we want to be able to explain why those ex explanations are, are more correct than others based on our understanding of evolution by natural selection. So to get you started in thinking, you should stop here, pause, and click on this link to watch a five-minute section from Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson doing an incredible job of explaining how dogs evolved. It's great. Pause here, five minutes, watch the video, and then let's come back and talk some more. I hope you enjoyed that. There's no one like Neil deGrasse Tyson to tell a great science story. Okay, so now, we're going to proceed here with uh, figuring out who has the best explanation. Okay, so here's the scenario. A family has been learning about evolution. They are watching an episode of Cosmos and find out that modern gray wolves and dogs diverged from an extinct wolf species some 15,000 to 40,000 years ago. How could you explain how wolves and dogs became different species? Okay, so you have a variety of people here. Luis says, wolves and dogs probably lived separately, so they became more different over time. David, they probably lived in different places because wolves and dogs behave differently. Wolves avoid humans and dogs love to be around humans. Elena, if some wolves were friendly and helpful to humans, the humans might have fed those wolves and taken care of them. Mom, Humans might have bred the friendly wolves. Their offspring would have similar traits to the parents. Dad, new species evolve all the time. This is just a natural process of speciation. Okay, so who do you think is most correct in explaining how we get dogs from a wolf kind of ancestor? Uh, pause here, think about this and then we'll go through the answers. Okay, here is the key. So let's look at Luis. Luis said they separated, they lived separately, so they probably became more different over time. So this is the right track in terms of thinking that if species get isolated from one another, um, they start to evolve differently independently. But he hasn't told us why the dogs and wolves would be separated or how they became different. David answers, David's answer that they lived in different places um, observes differences between dogs and points out possible variation in traits, but doesn't really explain how dogs became as domesticated as they are compared to wolves. Elena proposes an advantage to dogs being friendly to humans. This is really key. This was a trait that some of the wolves had. Not all of them, but some of them did. 
Mom says that humans might have bred the friendly wolves. According to the key, mom is the most correct. Mom has touched on artificial selection when humans drive evolution by artificially selecting for traits they favor. So she has proposed a mechanism. Dad isn't completely wrong. He just really hasn't answered the question. Sure, uh, evolution is going on all the time as is speciation. If we could stand back and see enough time, we could, we could watch evolution happening, but it hasn't explained how. So really, Elena and mom are giving us the critical pieces of information because there was variation within the wolves. And those that are more friendly towards humans, less stressed by humans and willing to get closer to those humans and benefit from the food that humans left around or threw to them, whatever, then those wolves are gonna have a higher chance of surviving. And that is gonna put a selective pressure on friendliness in wolves. And more and more of those will survive and pass on to their pups this trait. And so it's really Elena and mom that give us the answer to the mechanism. Okay, let's look at another example. Now we're gonna look at the very critical issue of how bacteria populations can become resistant to our antibiotics. So here's the scenario. A group of students are discussing their recent field trip to a local farm. They learn that a population of bacteria live in the soil on a farm. The farmer has been using antibiotics to treat the animals gradually exposing the soil bacteria to them through runoff and animal waste. How do bacteria cope with their changing environment? Sam says the bacteria mutate in response to the antibiotic exposure. Through mutation, some individuals develop the ability to survive at higher antibiotic concentrations. These individuals reproduce while the other bacteria die because their offspring inherit the ability to survive at higher antibiotic concentrations, the entire population evolved to be more tolerant of antibiotics. Casey says, because of genetic variation, there are already individuals in the population of bacteria that can tolerate increased exposure to antibiotics. These individuals survive better than their peers and produce more offspring because their offspring inherit the ability to survive at higher antibiotic concentrations, the entire population evolves to be more tolerant of antibiotics. Rory suggests all of the bacteria adjust their cell machinery so that they can survive exposure to antibiotics. When the bacteria reproduce, their offspring inherit this adjustment and the entire population evolves to be to be more tolerant of antibiotics. So pause here, read this over, and decide who you most agree with and why. And then we'll talk about the key together. Let's talk about whose explanation is most correct and why. So Sam is actually incorrect in saying that bacteria mutate in response to the antibiotic exposure. So mutations are just constantly happening randomly uh, as DNA is copied. So it's true that individual bacteria with mutations that help them to survive will be able to reproduce, but they're not mutating in response to the uh, presence of antibiotics. Casey, on the other hand, is most correct in saying that there's already variation within the population and that variation is produced by random mutations and by, by the way that gametes are made. But natural selection is acting on that already existing variation. So some of those bacteria that already had the ability to tolerate higher levels of antibiotics, they are then gonna be their survivors. Their DNA will become more prevalent in subsequent populations. Rory, on the other hand, is 
really incorrect in saying that the offspring inherit this adjustment as if the bacterial cells could somehow determine that they need to adjust and they can pass on this adjustment. So tanning is, is an adjustment to the environment when we're exposed to a lot of sun, but we know that babies don't inherit a suntan from their parents. So Rory sounds more like Lamarck than Darwin. Casey has the best explanation. We've come to the end of uh, a look at two other examples of evolution. So check your understanding. Can you apply the principles of evolution by natural selection to these new scenarios? Are you able to identify more or less correct explanations of evolution? Can you explain why the explanations are more or less correct using your knowledge of evolution by natural selection? What's next? If these examples were challenging to you, review lesson 3.1 and your explanation from 5.2. Or reach out to your teacher for additional assistance and resources. If you're interested in learning more, consider these resources. So there's a video um, called Clearly Stated, Does the Theory of Evolution Really Matter? PBS has created a uh, interactive that will allow you to explore deep time or what's also called geologic time. Uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institution has a cool timeline interactive where you can look at mass extinction events and there's also a PBS video called Eons. So uh, let me just show you briefly there's also an introduction to geologic time PowerPoint. Let's just take a quick look at that. Taking a sneak preview of the geologic time PowerPoint, it, this PowerPoint will give you the opportunity to take a look at how long the Earth has been around, basically about four and a half billion years, and a lot has gone on in those four and a half billion years. So uh, geologic time is really, really hard for us humans to contemplate the enormity of that kind of time span. So there's some information here in this PowerPoint about that, as well as about dating of, of fossil finds. How do we know how old something is? So if you're interested in such things, check out this PowerPoint. Here is the HHMI mass extinction timeline which is also something really cool to look at. Uh, and so what you see here is that there's very good evidence that there have been five major extinction events over the course of life on this planet. So you can click on any one of these and get information. So the famous one that everybody knows about is here that happened some 65 million years ago. It's the extinction of the dinosaur. So when you click on here, you see Okay, this is the Cretaceous extinction. We see the environmental factors, CO2 going up, pH going down, oxygen levels going down. There's a lot of um, volcanic activity and 76% of species went extinct. And you can see what life used to be like on the planet before this mass extinction, which occurred with change in, in uh, climate and then this disastrous asteroid impact that smashed into the Yucatan area and uh, created all kinds of climate change. Okay, so you can so you can look back. I mean there have been all these different extinction events. Here's another very extraordinary one, the end of the Permian, and look what life was like then. Um, and we learned that 96% extinction rate, so huge extinction rates. Now we have what many scientists are calling the current sixth extinction, and this is human driven. We know we're impacting our environment in a huge way, and this likely is leading to another extinction event. So 
check out this information. And that's it for other examples of evolution, as well as some other resources that are here for you to look at so you can continue to learn about evolution. Thanks, everybody.